God, who has blessed us with everything that we need, and we pray that we never take that for granted. You have sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, that we're able to have a chance for a home with you in the end, and for that we are so grateful. We thank you so much, Father, for loving us, and we just pray, Father, that we love each other just like you love us, and we pray that you be with those who are not well, those who are traveling, and those who lost loved ones. We pray on this day that we will worship you in spirit and in truth, and that we do everything that we can to give you all glory, all honor, and all praise. We pray that you be with Brother Richard as he share with us your word. Continue to bless him in every which way as he share his, the word with us, and that we're able to obtain something from it, to use it in our everyday lives, and to share with those in our network. Father, we love you, and we thank you for all things, and we pray, Father, we do this in a way that will make you proud. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So we are continuing in the lesson starting in chapter 3, page 31 of our book, God's Way Versus Our Way, Putting Aside Personal Desires. And last week, uh, we looked at just the opening chapter in terms of how we uh, comport who we are how we uh, allow ourselves to exist in this time side of eternity following God's precepts and his words to us. <clears throat> so this morning, we're going to pick up pursuing personal desires, and we'll go, we should be able to make it through the entire chapter, uh, I'm sorry, the entire uh, section, and then we will go on from there. So pursuing personal desires, the author starts with sadly and I find that uh, interesting that he starts with sadly but what he's talking about is right sad it's, it's possible to know a lot about the Bible without allowing that knowledge to have any measurable impact on the way you live or the decisions that you make uh, countless people claim to wear the name of Jesus but not all of them follow his example or obey the moral teaching he has given us in the New Testament. Many are governed by much less demands, demanding standards. <clears throat> For instance, following God's word, some Christians make decisions based on their personal desires. Paul spoke such, about such people in his letter to the Philippians. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their, their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, according to Philippians 3, 18 through 19. Some translations say, whose God is their appetite. According to the MacArthur New Testament commentary, appetite translates koilea, which refers anatomically to the abdomen, particularly the stomach. Here it is used metaphorically to refer to all unrestrained sensual, fleshly, bodily desires. People under consideration in this passage were being condemned because they did not worship God, but bowed down to their spiritual impulses and their unrestrained pursuit of sensual, sensual pleasures. You said the The people under consideration in this passage were being considered because they did not worship but bowed down to their sensual impulses and their unrestrained pursuit of sensual pleasures, not spiritual. <laughs> if I said spiritual, it didn't mean spiritual. Though. Such people have bought into the hedonistic worldview that pleasure is the highest good and proper aim of man. Unfortunately, some of these, uh, some of even some of the people sitting next to you on Sunday morning even have embraced this philosophy and are therefore preoccupied with self-gratification, whether by sex, drugs, or alcohol. The prevailing attitude amongst such people is that if it feels good, do it. Although certain things might feel good in the moment, the long-term impact of this approach to life causes one to become an enemy of the cross of Christ. Those foolish enough to start down this path seem dangerously unaware of sin's progressive nature and enslaving influence. 
Paul described the awful mess people get into when they bow down to the God of personal desire. According to Paul, such people grow to a point of being past feeling and eventually give themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and with greediness, according to Ephesians 4.19. Other translations shed even more light on this unfortunate state of existence, explaining that those who indulge in every kind of impurity end up struggling with a continual lust for more. Those who live for pleasure eventually reach a point at which they become greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The author of a book about spiritual warfare shared this graphic illustration of sin's progressive nature. It says, while studying clinical psychology in graduate, stu graduate students several years ago, I ran across a photo in one of my textbooks of a young heroin addict that perfectly illustrated sin's addictive power. To satisfy his need, he had collapsed every vein in his arms, then his legs, and finally through the course of depleting all over other available ports, he had found the last. He lay in a doorway dead, the hypodermic needle still in his tongue. It was an unpleasant yet graphic picture showing the end of every addictive sin. Not only are alcohol and drugs addictive, all sin is addictive. The same self-destructive behavior exists in all who allow the devil to deceive them to the point of having petrified hearts, no matter which route of temptation and sin they take. The end is spiritual destruction, according to Joe Beam seeing the Unseen 26. Now that's the author's <clears throat> rendition of pursuing personal desires. And as I'm always apt to say, uh, to teach is to learn twice. Uh, one, you have to learn it sufficiently to share and teach others, but at the same time, if we're honest, we're also teaching ourselves. And so we're then learning it a second time, right? So from that perspective, uh, when we talk through some of the points that the author uh, looks out, I will want to focus on three or four uh, highlighted key elements, and then uh, that'll be the, the, the uh, summation of the class. So, and he starts out, it is impossible to know, I mean, it, it, it is possible to know a lot about the Bible without allowing that knowledge to have any measurable impact in the way that you live or to make decisions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm mindful thinking about that of our current state of affairs. Uh, you know, there are various things that are occurring even in our country from a political perspective. There are things occurring socially and particularly when we consider, and I'm not uh, impugning anyone because I think we can all stand impugned and there's no uh, need for, for uh, calling you know, folks out, but to make a point here, this notion of knowing a lot about the Bible but without having any knowledge uh, on decisions that we make, I, I think about some who are now so focused on certain aspects of society and attempting to legislate certain actions and certain things that, wants, that we want to uh, quell or dismantle or put aside all under the guise of religion. Mm. Uh, we use the same religious principles, and I put that in air quotes, because we are seeking to uh, serve and, and propagate that which we know the God, that God's word tells us. But at the same time, while we're doing that, we are not doing some of the things that we find to be more clearly stated in, word, in the word of God in terms of loving one another, taking care of one another. I mean, you see throughout the scripture when Jesus uh, was here on this, walked on this earth, he spent a lot of time with those who had not. He spent a lot of time with sinners. He spent a lot of time with people who needed him the most. And I'm reminded of what, uh, so my mother had 10 kids and, and somebody, you know, I guess in their wisdom sought to ask her, which 20 kids do you love most? I knew it was me, of course. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought anyway. Uh, but she answered that with a, a really, I thought, smart quip. She said, whichever one had the greatest need at the time. That's where she would focus her love. Not that she loved any one of us any less or any different, but wherever there was a greater need, that's where she focused her attention. 
Otherwise, what she poured into all of us was sufficient in demonstrating her love, right? And so when we think then about God's love towards us, even when the word of God tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, the least of these, we understand that we should be mindful to, to provide for the least of these. We see the Bible talk, telling us to take care of widows and orphans. We see the Bible teaching us to distribute if you have wealth to those who have not. But we focus on these other things to the extent that we disregard some of the more critical and important things, helping others, showing that type that type of agape love. I, I like the name of our congregation, by the way, agape love, uh, because that's the meeting the need love, right? That's the love that meets needs. And when we are then so focused on trying to tell somebody how wrong they are and what they believe, but not focus on meeting the need, to me that illustrates this opening uh, salvo from, from this passage with respect to uh, knowing a lot about the Bible, but not allowing any of that knowledge to have a measurable impact in the way we live. And I think when it comes to how we live, we should demonstrate our love for others by helping, by being there to support one another. Uh, there, there's just all of the wedge issues versus love. I think the love would cause us to focus on meeting the needs of our constituents. We've got folks who are falling through the cracks every day. Uh, I'm a veteran, and, and as a veteran, uh, a lot of my comrades that uh, are coming home from having fought in the country's longest war are facing some, I mean, tremendous crises. Uh, the, the rate of veteran suicide has increased exponentially uh, since even the Vietnam War they experienced that kind of post-traumatic stress after having encountered the Vietnam War. The point I'm making here is we've got so many of our brothers and sisters who have greater needs that we're not focusing on because we can focus on or we can put our attention on that which is shiny, that shiny object or that thing that captures everybody's attention at the mm -hmm. moment, but not focus on some real needs. Does that make sense? And when it comes to how we are, are living our lives, uh, in the kingdom of God and how we want to be pleasing to God. Uh, I, don't, I, I say this again, this is the world according to Richard. This is Richardology. You might not find this in, 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 in the Bible, but uh, for, for me, I, I believe it's important for us uh, not to let ourselves get so caught up in the, 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 the shiny aspects, the, the, the sexy things of the world, as opposed to focusing on the critical things where people's needs should be where, where we can help and demonstrate our love one to another and how we support one another because life life gets hard and without having a, a support system life can overtake you and you can find yourself caught up in some things just because of without having the safety that gene one of the things that I, I've noticed um, through the domino effect that we've been talking about and we talked about good, choosing good versus evil last uh, last month and, and now uh, on to this topic. The shiny and the sexy things that you mentioned are those things that are pleasing to our eyesight, right? We gotta be careful the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, right? We have been conditioned to focus more on an entertainment God than a God of empowerment. And what happens with that is if we focus more on the entertainment aspect, if it doesn't make me feel good, if it doesn't excite me, if I don't walk away with something feeling like I've been entertained, then I'm not going to entertain it. Mm. So God has created us here not to entertain each other, but to empower each other. But our world spends more time on the flashy, the sexy, all those other things, which are entertainment to the eye, and less of empowerment. Why is it that when someone gets up and starts to speak about something that's really good, we only give them golf claps? We don't give them the same energy as we would when we go to a football game and we're screaming at the top of our lungs. And so it makes all the sense in the world when we look at what kind of God you're looking for, 
Because many of us are looking for that entertainment God to give us the empowerment God results. And it's not going to happen that way. No. So we're fighting against that on a regular basis. And that's one of the reasons why we are not meeting the needs of those who really need the needs. Yeah. In case, you know, like what you were saying about those individuals who are coming back from the wars and dealing with PTSD, where they train them how to kill, but they didn't turn them, they didn't train them how to turn it off. Yeah. So overall, what God are we serving? What God are we looking for? The entertainment God, the one who will make us feel good, or the God of empowerment, the one who will please our soul and get us closer to God. Whichever one that we are serving is the one that's going to show in our action. Yeah, I, I agree with that. In fact, one of our, this congregation, as we've been sustaining and building, as you brothers know, one of our primary objectives is to establish ourselves in this community so that we can branch out and serve this community. We can serve anyone from the greater Houston area, right? But we've planted our seeds here such that we can then help and grow in this community a little bit at a time. Now, as we grow in this community and helping and meeting needs and demonstrating agape, sure, there will be others from other communities coming, but our objective is to serve and help right where we are. Uh, that, that reminds me of a, of a, um, it's a, it's a managerial theory called Acres of Diamonds. And the way that story goes is that the, there was a man who, uh, on his property, he, he bought the property with the understanding that he could find diamonds on that property. And for years and years, he dug and dug, and he never found the diamonds that were promised. And then it got to a point where uh, he decided to sell that property and pursue other opportunities. And as he sold his property to the next owner, the next landowner, not even knowing that there was potential for diamonds there, he bought the property and as he was digging just to plant, he discovered acres of diamonds. And so the model of the story is uh, sometimes your best opportunity is right where you are. And we just have to continue to dig and plow to pursue that which we know. And the Bible tells us that, that we should treat this, this, this powerful word as hidden treasure. And if, if we treat this as hidden treasure, we're digging for a hidden treasure. If we know that there's a treasure there, why would we ever give up digging? Right? And so we're digging right here. So I appreciate those comments. And it's fact, and I see your hand, Lauren. In fact, that's the, the author ends page 32 with that whole notion of if it feels, well, the, the, the world has come to accept that notion that if it feels good, do it. Y'all yeah, remember that song by Brass Construction or I dating myself? Uh, do it till you're satisfied. Do it till you're satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got some old souls in here, Mark. <laughs> Glory be to God. I think that um, the devil has worked with, even with the people on the outside, the people who are non Christians, they have worked in our hearts too. The devil has worked in our hearts to get Christians too because we're not finding or coming together as Church of Christ to get the, um, get the word out to help other people. I think that we can, um, if we come together as Church of Christ instead of letting petty things can the Church of Christ have a woman preacher? Because that's just the preaching over here. But, but no, I mean, but yes, ma'am. Absolutely. That there are so many people that I grew up with who left the church and they grew up in the church. How many friends and family that grew up in the church and they left the church? No, <laughs> no, you, you, you are telling the absolute yeah. truth. <laughs> but we can be like, like clapping and that's like, come on, man, like we have to be better than that. God wants us to be better than that. So, so once again, you know, we're focusing on some other things and not the things that are important, not the things that are going to fulfill, uplift, and, and, and uh, to support 
long term. I, I agree with that 100%. I saw uh, Mark was saying too. You, you mentioned something earlier um, when you talked about the world's way versus God's way. Mm -hmm. And the world's way has now gotten to a point where we'll let a little bit of God in just enough so that people are deceived and they think that they're doing the right thing. Uh, Paul talks about that in his letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And um, what it boils down to is verse 12 where he says, those that will live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. Some of us aren't willing to pay that cost. Mm. We're willing to do everything up until, but then once you talk about suffering persecution, that's a whole different ball game. And, and I don't want to do that. But I'm going to do this, I'm going to do just enough over here so that I think that I'm living a life that is satisfying. And that sort of ties in with the illustration of the addict, right? Uh, the addict says, I want to get better. I don't want to live this life. But then they think about the quote unquote discomfort they will have without that coping mechanism. Yeah. And then it just begins to be too much for them. And they go back to it. Well, all, all wonderful uh, comments that are germane as well. In fact, uh, I couldn't agree more. When, when we consider what the author as he's ending his thoughts on page 32, uh, where he says a prevailing attitude among such people is that if it feels good, do it. He goes on to say, although certain things might feel good in the moment, the long-term impact of this approach to life causes one to become an enemy of Christ. Then he goes on to say that there, there are those who are foolish enough to start down this path are seemingly dangerously unaware of sin's progressive nature and enslaving influence. And the, the, the progressive nature of sin is such that it's subtle. It's, it's not bombastic. It's not immediately identifiable. You remember the story of Lot uh, in, in Genesis chapter 13 and in Genesis chapter 14 uh, that you see that Lot allow the progressive nature of his thoughts to lead him to Sodom. In fact, in verse 10 of chapter 13, the Bible records that Lot lifted, of, of Genesis, Genesis 10, 13, uh, I'm sorry, 13, 10. Uh, the Bible says, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou cometh into Zion. So he lifted up his eyes, right? Then in verse 12, we see that the Bible records that Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot then dwelled in the cities of the plain. And what did he do? He pitched his tent towards Sodom, right? Uh, if you get then over in chapter 14, uh, verse 12, you see that as recorded, and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods had departed. Uh, you'll see a progressive nature of sin represented in, so in, in Lot's actions. Now, did Lot just intend to find himself engulfed in Sodom? Perhaps not. But we do see the progressive nature of how things can occur. First, after he lifted up his eyes, pitched his tent. And after he pitched his tent towards Sodom, you see him dwelling in Sodom. You know, he, he's now, before uh, they could even be saved, you know, he was at the gate. He, he was engulfed by it. Well, I say that same thing exists with all of us in terms of how we uh, show up and how we live and how we comport ourselves. This, this nature of, I mean, this, this, this notion of, of sin having a progressive nature, if it's unchecked, if, if it's not bridled, it can engulf you. Just like everyone is saying now, that there's things that, that we can do that can help us, that will prevent us from falling prey to the progressive nature of 
sin. And it all starts and comes back. And y'all hear me say this every time that I'm talking in, in front of you, you always hear me talking to you about how you think. Because how you think is so important to who you are. The things that you think into existence is what's going to become. Yes, sir. Um, something, well, what you said there just brought me back to something that Brother Friedman brought out a couple of weeks back. Um, when Jesus was teaching on the parable of the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. in Matthew 13, and he said the kingdom of heaven was likened to a man who sold a field of wheat, and while he slept, his enemy came and sold tares among the wheat. Mm -hmm. And that's what the world's way does. It, it comes in and it progressively puts in those things that are not of God. Instead of just putting salt in the field and killing everything, we'll let you have some of it, but then we're gonna put this uh, this little bit in, right? We're gonna sprinkle this, this little leaven into the, into the lump. Mm -hmm. We're going to live in the whole loaf without you knowing. And I've taken it a step further. As he shared that, I recall him sharing the whole idea that the man could have just burned the field. He could have poured salt into the field and just destroyed it all, right? But the pernicious nature of sin and Satan's his beguiling tactics are always designed to subtly refocus us away from God's intentions and plans for us. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of progress, the progressive nature of sin is, is just like that as well. I mean, when we are growing up, when the wheat is growing up with the chaff, you know, the, the, the wheat has to, it's got its own nature. It, it's, it is what it is. But if we are not careful and we're trying to, mm, this kind of goes, I'll, I'll keep on my current path because I, I will divert. But the point is, the, the the nature of who we are in general is is designed to produce what's been planted. You will not produce anything different than what's been planted, and that's why you hear me say, because our nature is to respond to our thoughts. That's why we have to be careful of the thought seeds that we plant in the garden of our minds. Why? Because seeds grow yeah. after their kind. Yeah. And so when we are patterned after the almighty God, what he wants us to do is to be relying upon him and that which he's planted in us will grow if we don't stifle it yeah. or thwart it. We have some role in this process. It, it's not that we just exist and we allow God to do everything for it. No, he made man after his own image and he gave us the ability to think, to make decisions, to reason, and to act upon that which we know. And he wants us to willfully follow him such that we can avoid sin and the progressive nature thereof. And then he will protect us just like in that field where the wheat and the chaff was growing. He didn't destroy the whole field. He destroyed that which was not in his intention or in his plan. You have another comment? What Martha said, he said, well, I it guess is. the person was asleep, right? And that's the problem. We're the, problem. We're the focus. Mm. And sometimes we're asleep, and they sneak in. They see and sneak in. We got to stay woke. Like Brother Eugene said, we have to know who God is. We have to know his characteristics so we can stay woke. Because right when we fall asleep, right when we turn our head, it's coming. Well, you know, you use that term woke. And you know, right now, the world, or at least there are some who are making that word woke mean something derogatory. It's been co-opted to mean something different for political gain and such. But 
yes, we do need to be woke because to your point, as, as stated, the man was asleep, which allowed those seeds of, 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 of uh, the chaff to be uh, planted. And I don't have any problem with being woke. I'd rather be awoke than sleep in this current environment as well. And I don't let anybody, in fact, I tell you, wear it like a badge of honor. If someone tells you all oh, you woke because you, you know, have the, the, the mindset to do that which is right and you want to expect uh, better and more from this set of circumstances that we find ourselves in economically, governmentally, et cetera, politically, we should be woke. Because if we're not woke, we, we will find ourselves just being swayed by every thing and every wind and, and all those, those, those various, in fact, as this, this author is going to reveal to us, we, we wind up making decisions that are not fully baked and, and founded. So absolutely, I saw two hands, Sister, Fre Sister Freeman and then uh, Brother Eugene. I think I may have saw yours first. So. Well, I'm, I'm a little confused. I just want to get put you on track with what you're saying. Because you said the term saying work is, is now used in a derogatory sense. I wasn't familiar, I'm not familiar with that. I, I thought it meant something positive. To stay woke it means to stay focused or or uh, attentive or but I'm I'm not I'm not familiar with the negative connotation. Okay, well, I'm happy to share. <laughs> I'm all too happy to share. <laughs> My brothers can know that I stay plugged into this political stuff. I'm just a political news junkie. But wokeness is now a derogatory term from a political perspective. So if you have any intention or any desire to even learn about our history, uh, they've now co-opted CRT to mean something that the CRT was you're familiar with CRT? CRT is critical race theory. And so critical race theory is now a, a, a cudgel that's being used by uh, right-wing politicians, evangelicals, et cetera, uh, to, to bash progressives and liberals. And anyone who's deemed to be attentive to uh, the things that are happening politically, i.e. Um, abortion, homosexuality, all of the, the sins that politicians want to place into the ether so that they can create wedge issues to generate votes or gin up their base, it's now being described as you're woke just because you are conscious about these issues that the politicians are now using as wedge issues. So that wokeness being as a derogatory term is actually from the political angle, not from how we are discussing it now. So I would say, again, you better off woke because now we have a consciousness and awareness of everything. I was trying to stay out of the political realm. Uh, I can't help it sometimes, but you know, I, I can spend the whole lesson there. Then <laughs> all right, Eugene. The world uh, is all about entertainment, and where there's entertainment, when it's set just right, it's a tool for Satan to take us away from it being in power. So the, the agenda of the world, that evilness, that the Bible references multiple times about it being a dark place, uh, which is there's evil in darkness. The agenda of the world is for us to not be woke because I can control you when you're not woke. Now we woke about everything else. We woke about finances, we woke about a relationship, we woke about the, the how we can go to a vacation spot that real nice. We, we woke about those things. We woke about how to save some money on our groceries and all those other things. But when it comes to something that really steps on the toes of the world, that's when they're going to take that world, like submissive, take it and turn it around to its self gain and use its, its puppets in the platform to be able to promote what the world's agenda is and saying this is not Right. And since many of us don't take the initiative to 
uh, think for ourselves and to research for ourselves, we will believe those individuals that's on the platform that are part of the world's evil agenda. We don't want you to be woke. We want you to be silent. We want you to be quiet. Why? Because when I am woke, now I'm a threat to evil. And when I am woke, especially when I'm running with the word of God, evil cannot stop that. And evil knows that. So I'm going to do everything that I can to deceive you, to make you believe that this is not a good thing for you. That's where we come in in our relationship with God, to stay away. So when we see that type of stuff coming our way, we know how to address it. That is the reason why, from a political realm, they're saying this woke stuff is bad because it's stepping on their toes and they know that once you're awake, I can't stop. There's even legislation in Florida by the governor and it's actually called the anti-woke bill. I mean, this thing has, I see your hand, Brother Freeman. So this, this, to your point, Gene, and as this has been raised by the comments, again, so Satan always attempts to use that which is good to per make it perverse and disruptive such that he wants to also disrupt God. He wants to disrupt God's plan. And that's why it's important for us to understand what thus saith the word, so that we can then still be conscious and still be fighting this battle and still be even for our own selves. Because again, it's not just about what's going on with everybody else, it's us, I, what's going on within me too, or what's going on within you individually as well. We, we have to be uh, mindful of, of all of the, 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 the devices and craftiness that, that the evil one will try to use to disrupt and, and, and get us off, knock us off of, off of our square. Brother Freeman. You, you made the precise point that I was about to make. You, you, you just hit it right now on the head. As our good brother Eugene has said, articulated, and everyone has just said so effectively, so articulately, clearly. What we have to do is be mindful of the grander scheme the objective, there are some words that we seldom use in our vocabulary. We, we don't give them the consideration or the meaning that they have. Sinister, treacherous, and pernicious. And we're dealing with a diabolical fault. And when you went back to the original thought, and as Brother Marcus brought up, what the enemy did is what Lauren said, while men were sleeping, he took advantage of a natural process. This is the natural aspect of man, to rest, to sleep, to not, and while we're resting and sleeping, we're unattentive, we're not seeing what's going on. And so the diabolical one, the sinister one, the pernicious one, he takes advantage of these natural inclinations to work his will. And he demonstrates his diabolical nature and how truly sinister he is by not just destroying it, by not just setting it on fire, by not just ruining it. He manipulates it. He fixes it so that those of us who wake up, we're not aware of what's happening. So we look around right now wondering, well, when did it happen that young children started really disrespecting their parents? When did it happen that you could call your parents by their first name? When did it happen that you could just talk back? When, when did that take place? When did it happen that teachers couldn't discipline students? When did it, what happened? Well, while we were sleeping, mm -hmm. different legislation came in, different mindsets came in. When did it happen that you couldn't lock your door at night. You had to lock your door at night. When, 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 when did this stuff start taking place? Something shifted in the way we started thinking about life, about ourselves, about. And so, as Brother Eugene pointed out, we're much more apt to be titillated and entertained than we are to be informed and be made aware. There's a movie on. Uh, I think it's still running on Netflix right now. It's called Don't Look Up. 
And if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. And I, it's, it's ridiculous in some aspects of it, but there are other components of it that is hitting right on what we're talking about right now. The mindset that says, don't pay attention to what you can obviously see happening. Look over here. Don't, don't give any attention. Now, it's a meteor coming. It's coming. But don't look up. And it's, it's almost ludicrous. But then again, we went through four years of absolute <laughs> lunacy. <laughs> when you think about it politically. And so you wonder, okay, something happened. And those of us who are striving to be righteous, individuals who are striving to be spiritually minded, can see it clearly, and then we're made to feel like you're out of touch by doing that. It's something wrong with you. You, 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 you. Don't, don't call attention to that. Because when you call attention to it, you're not being tolerant. You're not being loving. You're not being considerate. So the encouragement, just as you're pointing out there, uh, Brother Richard, is that we have to keep Christ focused in our lives. And do what Jesus would do. Going back to your original point, Jesus was people oriented. And when we're people oriented, then you'll understand. Yeah. You'll understand what, what, what's really important. Yeah, I, I, boy, those are, those are awesome, awesome comments. I call it the Oz theory. Y'all remember the Wizard of Oz? <laughs> when he was caught, and he was like, pay no attention to the, the man behind the curtain. Because mm -hmm. what he wanted to do was continue to influence all of the activities as the wizard per se, but while he was manipulating the situation, once he was discovered, it's the odds theory. Don't pay no attention to what you see me doing. I want you to only focus on, on these other things that the Chris. I was gonna say, just to piggyback on what everybody has said so far, is what we are witnessing in this country is the end of the age. Yes. 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 Something that has never really happened in history. Talking about wokeness uh, and what and what's what's scary is is the country is forcing us to even in, in opposition to try to make sure that we're we're saying the right thing. It's forcing us to pick a side. Yeah. And if you're not careful, you'll pick a side which has nothing to do with Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for us for our own protection to be involved in the word. I just told a, a buddy of mine the other day that when you start thinking about things from a political standpoint, you start looking to the right side. Mm -hmm. Because if you start doing it from our own perspective, we'll pick a side. And so it's, it's, it's really scary and it's touchy and it feels like now that, hey, I can't speak for what happened a long time ago because we wouldn't been living. But in this period of time, it feels like Dangerous is enemy. So, 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 so I'll, I'll add just another element to it, even just to help you put into perspective what Chris just said, what all has been said, and then collect that to what we said. See, there is a theory now that if you are a Christian, if you, if you are a believer in Christ, you cannot be a Democrat. That, that's what they believe. You cannot be a Democrat if you, if you believe in, if you are a Christian. Why? Because all of the Christian principles are believed to be espoused by one party. So you got to now choose, right? And all along, while you are choosing based upon your Christian principles, they're doing everything in their power to disenfranchise. Everything in their ability to take away all of the things that we have fought so validly for. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end on this, this last comment because that's, that's my timer to remind me not to go beyond and I encourage you brothers to get y'all timer. Anyway, uh, <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> I, I didn't want to miss this one point though. In this last section where he talks about this continual lust for more, and then he gives, even before I read it, I'm taking my notes, and I'm thinking, that's a psychological thing. And he ends his message talking about the psychology aspect, and he's talking about this graduate, but the point I would be 
wanting to, to, to make and, and have us consider. Psychologically, we have built within us these things called endorphins. And these endorphins are the things that please us, that, that our minds latch on to when we have found some pleasure. And then that is the thing that we start to subconsciously and unconsciously pursue. I mean, we gravitate to that which we secretly love most. We meet in life the exact reproduction of our own thoughts. There's no chance, coincident, or accident in a world ruled by law and divine order. And when we consider that I've experienced something that gives me some element of pleasure, again, this the subtitle of this lesson is Pursuing Personal Desires. Once we have experienced that pleasure, that thing in our mind, those endorphins click into play, and it causes us to desire it. Whether it's a good pleasure or a bad pleasure. And if we're not careful, again, we can find ourselves spiraling out of control. And he uses a great example of this unfortunate individual who you know, just progressively got worse in terms of his addiction. But addictions are not just with drugs or alcohol, folks. There are many types of addictions. I mean, you've got, dare I say, spending addictions. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> let me clear my throat. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we, we always focus on... <laughs> on the negative stuff. And, and that's what Satan does, y'all. Satan will get us to focus on that thing and then we will be content with some other things just because it's not that thing and we're not focused on ourselves to the extent that we are actually falling prey to some other aspect of the pleasure principle. Y'all remember my sister Janet, did, did yeah. she see that? Yeah. Yeah. She sang that song too, The Pleasure Principle. Uh, and so as we wrap up this section of the book, Church, I, I, I hope that you know this, this lesson and even talking through it, just listening to all the comments, again, to teach us to learn twice. Starting with that, I'll end with that because uh, none of us are at the point where we, we can't still learn. We should continue to be coachable in all respects, and there, the, the contributions from the class today uh, were just poignant, and, and I appreciate the comments, and I appreciate the interaction. So uh, as we wrap up uh, the class, as we prepare to go into our morning worship, I'd like to ask, are there any requests for prayer? Are there any thoughts on anyone's heart that need to be taken before the Lord? Sister Savannah. We'll do, we'll do. Uh, and if you couldn't hear, uh, because of the distance, uh, Sister Savannah is requesting prayer on behalf of Sister Bucks, who's been hospitalized, and uh, we will certainly keep Sister Bucks in prayer. Any others? Prayers for the McKinley family. They lost their son uh, Friday evening in a, in a car accident. Mm -hmm. So prayers for Chris and uh, I believe her name is Felicia or D. McKinley. Uh, and, that, and that whole family during the end of the time of All right. Well, if you would, join your hearts for mine as we go to God in oh, prayer. Oh, oh. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty and all knowing God, the great I am, we come before your throne again this morning with thanksgiving in our heart, Lord, that you've given us your word, which reveals your mind to us such that we can understand what you desire of us. And we ask, oh God, that you will 
allow us to continue to grow and develop discerning spirits so that we can rightly divide your word, that we can make application in our lives. And Father, that we can live accordingly to be pleasing to you in all ways. And Lord, we just ask that your covering will be upon this congregation as we labor here in this area of the vineyard and that you will continue to strengthen us in our endeavors that we will uh, realize uh, your will for us individually and collectively and that we will also walk in our purpose to uh, do what you designed for us to do individually such that collectively we will uh, be pursuing those things that are uh, consistent with your will. Father, we also ask that you will allow your Holy Spirit to rest on behalf of Sister Bucks as she's recovering. Lord, we just pray uh, as Jehovah Rapha that your healing will be upon her, that the caregivers will uh, find an effective remedy and that she will uh, overcome and that we will be able to rejoice in her having been healed. And Father, we ask your blessings on behalf of the McKinley family this morning. We pray, Lord, that uh, your, your Holy Spirit will rest upon them, that you will give them peace in their time of trouble, that as they mourn the loss of their loved one due to uh, the tragic event that occurred, Lord, we know that you know all things. You knew exactly when this would occur. But Father, we pray that the family won't charge you falsely, but that they will look to you for all that they need and that they will draw closer to you, that Brother Eugene and others around them will be able to share words of encouragement that will help them to put into perspective this, this moment in time in their lives and that your uh, spirit will continue to cover them in all the ways. And Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit and your grace will rest upon uh, Brother and Sister Jones as they prepare to travel on this week, that you will allow them to arrive to Atlanta uh, safely and that they will have a wonderful time with family and friends and to return home and to find all things well. And Father, we just ask that you will continue to lift up and build up Brother Rodney as he's laboring here, Father, and that he will be uh, following you and as he's following you, he will lead his family accordingly. Father, we just pray for every family that's represented here uh, at the Agape Congregation on the sound of my voice, be it in person and or in the virtual realm, Lord, that you will help us all to continue to press toward the mark of the high calling, to continue to allow you to direct us, and that we will do all the things that will be pleasing and acceptable unto thee. And as we prepare to go into the, the service, God, we just ask that your blessings will cover Brother Freeman as he brings your message and that it will be uplifting, encouraging, and fulfilling in all ways. And it's in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.